Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Father, we pray that you will apply this word to our lives today by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. John Bunyan was uh, famous for writing Pilgrim's Progress. I'm sure most of you are aware. He was a 17th century English preacher who spent 12 years in jail for preaching, preaching without a license. You had to have a license in those days because the church was all sponsored by the state. It was a state church. And they had decided that some of the teachings that we would consider orthodox today were out of order. So people like the Puritans and others who wanted to purify the church were not allowed to preach. John Bunyan was one of them. While he was in jail, there were other nonconformists there as well. Usually they were Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists used to say to John Bunyan, listen, John, you keep assuring people of God's love. But by the way, this is what they did at night. They, they didn't know whether they're going to live or die the next day, right? So what do they do? They're in jail. They're preachers. They, they talk theology. So uh, this is what they're doing. And they say, you keep assuring people of God's love. If you keep pressing God's love, people will do whatever they want. And Bunyan said, no, no. He said, if, if you keep assuring people of God's love, they will do whatever God wants. That's a true statement. If we really understand who God is, how holy he is, and understand who we are, how far short, of, far short of his glory that we fall, and how far he has reached to save us, how much his love has meant to us, we would gladly do what God wants. We show that we don't really understand God when we live lives that are in some sense at least in rebellion against him. Well, that brings us to in our study of the prodigal sons, which we kind of took a vacation from in the month of March uh, with the approach of Easter and so on, but brings us to the second major character. We've already looked at the uh, rebellious younger son. We've seen his rebellion and we've seen his repentance as he came back to the father. But now we want to look at the father in this parable. The father, of course, represents God the father. And in this story, Jesus just, I mean, he breaks all the bounds that were thought about or known about in terms of what a father's love would look like in that culture or in any culture for that matter. This is a truly amazing look at what the love of God is like. But it's to help us understand who God is so that we will want God, which is where he wants us to be. It's like Hosea 11, where God describes Israel as a prodigal child, which indeed Israel was for most of his existence. 
He says in verses 8 and 9 of Hosea 11, he says, my, my heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender, even though the child is prodigal. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am a God and not a man, the Holy One, in your midst. And I will not come in wrath. What a picture that is of the, wrath of, of the love of God, of the heart of God. You know, eventually he will have to judge sin. Eventually he does judge Israel and Ephraim and Judah. His holiness requires it. Cannot continue to be God and just let sin go on unpunished and unchecked. But his first response, this is, I like to think of this as God as first responder. The first response of God is that he wants to encourage people, how much he loves them to encourage them to repent and to turn to him. You know, how much we suffer when we don't do that. We can never hurt God, but we can certainly hurt ourselves. And here in this passage, we're going to learn eight things that God does for us before we were ever turning toward him. Each one of them represents a different characteristic or attribute of God, and I hope that in the time that we spend in the study over the next couple, three weeks, that we will understand the love of God in such a way that it truly changes our lives. That we will truly get a grasp on him because here he is in his patience urging rebellious children to return to the blessing and to the safety of his arms. It's the only place there is blessing and safety is in the arms of God. So let's look at the first thing that God does for us. Number one, the Father lets us go. The Father lets us go. Now that sounds like a bit of a strange thing, but that's what this passage teaches. Notice verse 12. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. That little phrase there, and he divided his property between them, tells us a lot about God. Mostly it tells us that he gives people the power, the ability to reject him, to go their own way, to choose a sinful, selfish existence over a way with him. Now, knowing that we have a choice may sound like a good thing to us, a real benefit, right? Right? But actually, in one sense, it should strike terror into our heart to think that God has given us this privilege, that he lets us go. What it really amounts to is he's giving us enough rope to hang ourselves, which is what most of us do. The freedom to choose is both a blessing, but it's also a loaded gun. You know, as we begin to think that our ways are better than God's ways, as we begin to anticipate that we know more than he does, that his ways are onerous, now we like a few of his commands, but boy, the rest of them we could certainly live without. They're outdated, certainly not for the 21st century. As we begin to think like that, as we begin to take our pleasure where we can find it, as our theme song becomes, I did it my way, we need to consider what it means that God gives us the opportunity to do that. And I want you to see three things in this passage about the fact that God lets us go that I think are instructive. First one is he lets us go at his expense. He lets us go at his expense. Look at the request here. He says, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. I, I find that a really interesting statement, but I find it very like most teenagers that I know, like myself when I was a teenager. This guy wants to rebel, but he wants to, he needs his father's help in order to do it. He's asking God to finance his rebellion, essentially, right? It's what we all do. I think Jesus included this because he wanted us to see a very important and fascinating part of life when we are running from God, which is something we don't consider very often. When we neglect or deny or ignore or just kind of basically are indifferent toward God, we are actually playing, beloved, with house money. 
We could no more live or rebel or do anything against God on our own nickel than anything in the world. No one can. Everything that we are, everything that we ever hope to be comes from him. Well, I mean, I mean, where did you come from in the first place? You say, well, mom and dad. Well, that's true. From a human standpoint, they were the human instrument of getting you here, right? But David saw way beyond that when he wrote this in Psalm 139, verse 13. He said, for you, speaking of God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Jeremiah says, speaking as though he were God, he says, Behold, I formed you in the womb. I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Listen, every person who ever comes into this life owes a debt to God for their life to the, from the very beginning. We all do. He's the one who has given us the ability to live. We're not some accident. I mean, there's even a good part of that, right? We're not some cosmic accident that just happened. We're the product of an infinitely creative and loving God. The Bible records in Genesis 2, verse 7, then the Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Life, <laughs> Beloved, is a gift of God, and every move we make is at his expense. Every single one. What about your job? You say, well, listen, let's, don't drag God into that. I did that, after all. Thank you very much. I went to school. I worked hard to get where I am. I have made my own way. You can't say God had anything to do with that. Seriously? I mean, you really believe that? I mean, just answer a few questions about that, right? Number one, who gave, you the, who gave you the mind to enable you to get through school? Who gave you the ability that perhaps you've honed it yourself? Yes, but who gave you the ability in the first place? Who gives you health so that you're not like somebody else who had absolutely no fault of their own has ill health and can't work? Who did all of that? Who placed you in America rather than in Bangladesh where you'd probably be doing really well to be herding somebody else's goats, right? Who did that? You have to ask yourself, whose money have you been playing with? James says, James 1.17, he says this, he says, do not be deceived, my brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Listen, beloved, we live and move and do everything we do at the expense of our Heavenly Father, whether he, even if He's not our Heavenly Father, if we've never come to Him. It's intriguing to me that those who devise the most intellectual, the most onerous arguments, denying God or betraying God or even denying His existence, do so with the mind that He gave them. You realize that? There's nothing, listen carefully, especially you younger people, there's nothing from a natural worldview point of view that explains why anybody is a self has a self-conscious human mind. According to naturalism, we're just a, quote, collation of atoms that goes around in circles, just a bunch of chemical reactions. There's nothing that would, assume, that, that would suggest why we have self-consciousness from that perspective. There's nothing from a naturalistic perspective that can explain why we have any moral sense at all. In fact, if you delve deeply enough into the theories of evolution and the other theories that come along these days, you would find that, the, that the, at the heart of those, at the base of those, is the whole idea that, of survival of the fittest, which basically says we should be killing each other. And not because we think about it, but just because that's what we would do. The ability to think, the ability to react, the ability to love, the ability to care is unexplainable from a naturalistic, humanistic, evolutionary point of view. It's absolutely unexplainable. 
We're playing with house money, do you see? All along it's true. We accuse God of evil while holding to a system where evil has no meaning. Playing with house money. Repelling, rebelling against God on intuitions that he has placed within us. God knows why we are the way we are because he created us that way, right? He says in Romans 2.15, he says this, they show the work of the law written in their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or else excuse them. Why do you think? Why do you have a moral uh, 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 intuition? Why do you have the ability to recognize yourself? Because God put it there. God gave you a conscience. I mean, you can, you can skew it according to the Bible. You can render it not very effective, but it's all put there by God. You can't, here's the point. You can't leave God without God's help. But what ought to scare you is God will let you do it if you choose to. C.S. Lewis says it this way, and I've, I use this quote every once in a while, so I'm sure some of you have heard it. But he says, in the end, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God will say, thy will be done. How many people will use the freedom of God to destroy themselves in the end? What a tragedy. But it's because he lets us go at his expense. Secondly, he lets us go to his shame. He lets us go to his shame. When we rebel against the Father, big things are little, doesn't matter. We shame God. This young man certainly did. Note that he insists, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And his father divided the property between them. We pointed this out before, but in Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, the law would have prescribed that this young man should have gotten one-third of the property because his older brother would have been due uh, twice the share of the property. So he's really asking for one-third of all that his father had. Since his father's holdings would have been in land to provide the inheritance early would have meant selling the land off would have meant turning that land into money, cash somehow. It would have had to have been at a discount, obviously. It would have been selling without a particular market out there. It was a shameful thing to ask his father to do. Everyone recognized that. Everyone in this time would have recognized his father would have had a perfect right. In fact, the people in that period of time would have expected him to say, the father to say to the son, you're disowned. You, you're asking the impossible. You're asking something I wouldn't even consider to do. It's a shameful thing. And he would have shamed his son. Instead, this father takes the shame of the son, divides his property, divvies up the money, and gives it to the boy. He suffered the shame of meeting the son's outrageous request. The father's shame is amplified. If you, go, if you look with me at... At verse 13 in this passage, look at it. It says, not many days later, the son gathered all that he, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one, one ahead. Verse 12, the younger son of them said to the father, father, give me the share of property. And the word property that's used there is a word just simply means goods or material possessions, things like that. Give me the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Only the word property, the property there is not the same word. It's a different word. It's the word bios. We get our word biology from it. It means life, usually translated life. What Jesus is showing in this parable is that these two, the father and son, are looking at things from a completely different perspective. The son is saying that property that you have to me is nothing but cash on the barrelhead. Let's have it. Sell it off. Give me what you will, would owe me one of these days. I want to go. I'm tired of living here. But to the father, that property is his life. 
It's kind of like, do you remember the old, there's the, the song in the old uh, musical Oklahoma? I know those of you who are younger don't even know there was such a thing, but some of you may remember the musical Rodgers and Hammerstein, Oklahoma, and you, if you've seen it, you know, you remember this, the song where the phrase comes out, oh, we know we belong to the land, and the land we belong to is grand, right? Very rhythmical, very rhyming. They used to do music well, so it was, uh, you know. The land we belong, but, but it's they that belong to the land, not the land that belongs to them. See, that's what Jesus is picturing here. The land is this man's life. It's his identity in a, in a good sense. This is his mission in life is to take care of this land. And the son is saying, I don't care about your life. I don't care about the land. I don't care about your identity. I just want my money. So I want you to tear apart your life, cash it in, and divvy it up what he's asking. It all pictures a greater father who was born the shame of our own sin, right? Who's taken our place. Hebrews 12, 2 advises that we should be looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Imagine, if you can, and I don't think we really can, but try to imagine the shame that the father and the son experienced as the father, as the son hung on the cross, naked, condemned, humiliated by the very people that he had created, by the creation that he had put together in the first place. He's become part of that creation, and now that creation has turned on him. They have killed him. They have hung him on this cross where he is bearing the sin of all who will ever believe, suffering the humiliation, the shame of our wrongdoing. And it says that he did that despising the shame. Despise means to disregard or to consider of little importance to com compared to something greater. What's the something greater? That he might be able to offer forgiveness and cleansing. That he might be able to offer to us a life that we could not have in any other way. What a wonderful thing to have that life. But we can only have it because the Father suffered the shame on our behalf and the son suffered the shame on our behalf. What about the prodigals who will not return? What about them? I hope you're not one. I hope you've turned to the Lord. But Hebrews 6.6 6 tells us about the others. It says of those who will not repent, it says they are crucifying once again the son of God to their own harm they are holding him up to contempt. Those who will not take advantage of what the Father offers and what the Son offers in terms of the eternal life that he offers are shaming the Father continually. How? By their actions and by their attitudes and by their unresponsiveness, which basically says to the Father, sorry you sent Jesus to the cross. There was no use to do that. He didn't need to go there. You erred. Your mistake, your problem... I don't need him. I can get there my own way, thank you. I will be good enough that you cannot reject me. I don't need you. According to God, all we're doing is crucifying Jesus over and over and over again when we do that. Think, think you get away with that in the end? I like how D.A. Carson puts it. He says, when God, who has made us, and not only made us, but made us in his image, and then when we rebelled against him, when we have sinned against him, big ways and little, whatever, it doesn't really matter. We have fallen short of his glory. He has taken upon himself the penalty for our sin when all of that has happened. And yet we turn against him. We continually perpetuate the death of Christ by turning against him, saying, no, I will declare, my, I will declare from what's really good. What I declare good, you may declare evil. What I declare evil... You declare good. We seem to be at odds. Carson says what is so wretchedly tragic is God's image bearer standing over against God. This is the de-godding of God so that I can be my own God. Now listen, beloved, you can do that 
for a little while. But you can't de-God God forever. The only alternative is to submit to him. To come to a great appreciation for the love that he has shown in giving his life on our behalf. God has taken our shame so that we don't have to suffer it one day. So he lets us go to his shame. Thirdly, God lets us go for his purposes. Let's us go for his purposes. He lets us go at his expense. He lets us go to his shame and he lets us go for his purposes. This is an important thing to keep in mind. There are two purposes. The first purpose is he hopes for our return. He's let us go in the hope that we will return. He wants those who will love him because they love him. Not because they have to, not because they're a robot, not because they're an automaton of some kind. It says, verse 20 of this passage, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Dad let him go hoping for this return. Dad let him go, the relationship was broken. Dad let him go in the hopes that a little time away would cause this son to come to his senses, which in fact is what happened with this boy. He's a prime example of what Paul says in Romans 2.4 when he explains why God lets us go. He says in Romans 2.4, or do you presume on the right riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? If you don't understand that the only reason God has let you continue to live in rebellion against him is because he seeks your repentance, then you've missed the whole point. His purpose is that we would come to him willingly, seeing his great love for us, appreciating what he has accomplished, desiring to have his salvation. Why is God so patient? Why has he not... Why has he not wiped us out when we continue to pile up offense after offense after offense, big and little and in between? Why? Does he wait? Because he wants us to come to repentance. That's his heart. Intends his patience to bring us there. He's hoping that we will see his love and that we will respond to his love. But what about, what about the second purpose? Well, the second purpose of God is that for those who will not come, there's the possibility of rejection. And so there's the possibility of judgment that comes with that. But no one will ever be able to say, I didn't have a chance. I don't believe anyone will ever be able to say that. Romans 1 basically teaches that. It says, even, even if you said those who never heard the gospel, never heard about Christ, never heard anything like that, he says that there's enough in the natural revelation of the universe in which we have to point them toward God. That they are, quote, without excuse. God, if you want to look at it this way, the two purposes that he has in letting us go are number one, that we would come to repentance and an appreciation of the price that he has paid in order to bring us back. Or secondly, that we would choose any one of a million ways that we can go to hell in our own way. That's as, it's just as simple as that. But we choose. It's a scary thing to be let go by God. His purposes are always good. Ours not so much. Not until we're ready to turn to him. And so God lets us go. Second thing in this passage that I see about God the Father. The Father longs for our return. We've kind of talked about that a little bit. Verse 20 again, the father sees this boy coming a long way off. This is God's goodness exhibited. He longs for our return. So, so patiently waits because he is good. His heart is good. How did that, you, know, you have to ask yourself, how did that dad know that, the, that his son was coming a long way off? That could only be true if he's looking for him, watching for him, 
Every chance he has for however many years this has been, he's been at the window looking for that sun. He's turned the television off at night and he's looked for that sun. He's found every occasion that he can to look down that road, hoping the boy will be coming. And then one day he sees an old, decrepit looking, unkempt guy coming and he turns away thinking that can't be him and then something in his mind clicks and he thinks, boy, there's something familiar about the gate of that guy. And he looks back again. There's nothing very much to suggest that that's his son, but the walk is familiar. And the more he watches, the more he sees, that's my son. He's coming back. And he's so excited that he runs out to meet that son. What does this tell us about the father? He longs for our return. He longs for us to be with him. He longs for lost sinners to come to him. He longs for those who have, you know, they've just totally ruined their life. It's a mess of sin and compromise and whatever, wherever they've gone. He longs for those who are actually doing quite well, but there's an emptiness inside that nothing will ever be able to fill except God. It doesn't matter where we are on the path. God longs for our return. The day will come when he has to deal with the sin if we will not return. It may be longer or shorter. There's no promise in the Bible about how long God will wait. The fact that he waits even one second is a sign of his goodness. For some of us, it's been days and weeks and months and even years. But that's what his heart is. His heart is in the waiting, not in the judgment. He says this in Ezekiel 18, verse 32. He said, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. That's his heart. See what I've accomplished on your behalf. I've made it so that you don't have to do anything. Just turn and live. That's his heart. Peter tells us his heart. 2 Peter 3, 8. You've heard this many times. 3.9, he says, the Lord is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. But we must come of our own volition, the heartfelt desire to come home to him, the Father's heart. So our first two lessons about the Father. One, he lets us go. He lets us go in the hope of our return although he allows us the freedom to reject him if we will at our own expense. But secondly, he longs for our return. Sometimes sends famines and hardships and other things to try and turn us toward him. The Bible is very clear that many of the hardships that come in life are intended to focus our attention back on him. God is speaking. We're just not listening. And so God longs for our return. More than that, at great pain and shame to himself, he's paid the price for our return. We can return at no charge. We can return. Payment has been made. But from a human perspective, the choice is ours. 1982, August 28th, 20 year old private first class Joseph White who was stationed in Korea ran across the minefield of the DMZ there the demilitarized zone into North Korea his friends and fellow soldiers were hollering at him don't go come back but he continued people were trying to find out what are the motives for this and they really couldn't figure it out the soldiers who were close to him knew that he had run had a run in with his sergeant something about a girl that he'd been going with and somehow the sergeant didn't like that and had taken away his, his leave privileges and they were speculating maybe he went to be with that girl. They didn't know for sure. They just knew he went AWOL. So the army investigated, of course, when they released its official report, they basically came out and said, we don't know why he did it, but he's a traitor. He's defected. So his parents in St. Louis held a press conference. And his dad came out and he said, I, I've seen the report. 
I've heard what the other soldiers have said. He said, I accept that my son has been a defector. I, I accept that he's a traitor. Then he said this. He said, he has lost his credibility in this country, even with me. Then his father's heart showed. And he continued, he said, but I still love my son and I want him back. I want him back. That's the heart of God, beloved. He wants us back. He's turned us loose. We have the privilege to turn away from him, to reject him, to reject him passively, even as we sit in church and go through the motions, but our heart is not really with him, or to reject him very actively living a lifestyle that could never be compatible with him. But he wants us back. Multiply by a million times what that father said and you have the heart of God. Everyone who rejects, rejects the son of God has lost all credibility. They've shamed the father and the son and they do it continually. But here's what the Bible says in Romans 5.8. It says, when, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, we don't understand the depth of that phrase. But while we were still sinners, in a state of defection, in other words, Christ died for us. Joe White never made it back. Three years later, he died in captivity in North Korea. It was his choice. So it's our choice what we will do with Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Father's heart that has caused you to do what you never owed us, didn't owe us a thing. We can't possibly put you in our debt. That would be the most foolish thing that we could think, that by somehow, by some act or some series of acts, we could somehow put the God of the universe in our debt. How foolish. But what we could not do, you have done for us. You have sent your own son to absorb the sins that we commit every day, every minute. And you only ask that we accept this gift of grace by faith. So I pray that if there is anyone here this morning, and I know there are some who do not know you, never made a commitment of their life to you. I pray that just right now you would open their heart. We cannot do that. Lord, we understand they really cannot do that themselves. So we pray for you to open their heart. Cause them to see what you've done. Cause them to respond to the heart of a gracious, loving Father. And to come to you in humility seeking the mercy and grace that you so freely, freely give. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.